Hey, welcome to Wise Bites TV, the podcast that explores the intersection of business, tech, and culture. I'm your co-host, along with my friend, debate partner, and my sounding board, Josh Levine. How you doing today, Josh? You called me a friend. Oh, thank you. We almost made a scene at Barnes & Noble fighting over something the other day about marketing. <laughs> I'm super excited about today's show. Hold on, Josh. Since you okay. brought up, we had, a, we had a healthy debate a couple days ago at the Starbucks and Barnes and Noble. Josh, you didn't know this because I haven't had a chance to tell you, uh, but the lady behind you facing me, at one point, this is what I what I had saw from her. Oh, did she start filming? Oh. Uh, before we get started, what I wanted to do is I wanted to set the stage today, which Josh and I normally don't do. So our interests have steadily evolved from uh, just technology and culture into examining human experiences. And one of the catalysts for that, or one of the catalysts for that is um, one of the companies in our umbrella of companies is um, the, what's called Recruit Like You Sell. And the, uh, uh, the main partner of that is uh, Bart Dunn, who authored a book called, that's who that New York accent comes out of. There's certain yeah. words I just can't do. Authored, authored <laughs> a book, he had some coffee and he took the, you know, went for a walk. Um, so he, he, he wrote a book called The Unicorn Path, and, and Bart really focuses on um, employee first and empowering employees and how to train businesses to, uh, you know, take these employees, right? So he wants to he wants to establish unicorn company and unicorn employees, and that's what he does. So that, alongside with what Josh and I do and our passions and I talk about, and then um, I teach at a local college, and so those things combined really... Uh, want us to evolve more and look at uh, both sides of the experience, just not what we can teach, but also how other people are experiencing a lot of the, a lot of things going on, which is some of the you know we're going to talk about. So specifically, one of the things that um, that we find that we're passionate about and we talk about we talk about technology quite a bit. We talk about how it impacts uh, from hiring. Um, to uh, how it impacts somebody, you know, at their workplace. And a concern of ours, and, and mine from teaching also, and we have one question in there for you guys for that, is uh, the gap, the technology gap that, that's growing. And with the, I don't even want to say, in, you know, inception of AI, with the astronomical, you know, speed of AI infiltrating what we do, uh, we want to examine, you know, those things a little bit more. And now... We have you guys on here, which are going to, you know, really help uh, educate us and give us some in insight into thriving in the workplace and maybe how some of that, the things I just talked about, you know, integrates with that. So with Josh, with my long-winded setting the stage, uh, if you could kick us off. You want my campiness? Well, you know, yes. I'm super stoked today. Um, I'm really thrilled. And I think our Wise Bites listeners are really going to be excited. We got a treat for you today because we're buzzing with excitement. I told you this is going to be cheesy <laughs> to introduce Dr. Patricia Grabarik and Katina Sawyer, Dr. Katina Sawyer. And they're the dynamic duo behind Worker Being. And I don't know if you got a chance to check out their website yet, but we're going to have all the links down below. These two incredible women are not just PhDs. They're also superheroes of the workplace. And they use their powers of behavioral science and management to make our work lives happier and healthier. And I love your website and I love everything you got on there. I'm just, you know, I want you guys to introduce yourselves. I got bios together for you guys. And I was like, you know what? I want to hear from you guys. So like, what, what's your thing? What, you know, I, I, you know, I, I know, uh, Katina, and do you mind if we use our first names? We'll call you doctor, oh, yeah. doctor, doctor. No, doctor. no. First, point... name, first names are fine. <laughs> yeah. And I, I know you're at the Eller school, uh, down at U of A and, and that's super exciting. And I've had the opportunity to speak there and I just love it. But tell me a little bit about just introduce the, the two of you just introduce, yeah. let me know what you guys do. Well, first of all, I think we should let you write our copy because that was a really good introduction that I liked. Oh, there's a lot. more. I'll send you um, the whole thing. It's really no, campy no, no and cheesy, and there's like superhero stuff. It was awesome. really good. I, I thought you were going to change um, superheroes to Queen B, but you yeah, know. Yeah. no, no, yeah. We'll take it. Right all of those all right. sound good to me. Um, Go so, ahead, um, we're worker being, as you mentioned, and we are good friends from graduate school who 
went sort of separate pathways after we each got our PhDs in industrial organizational psychology, not as friends, but just career wise. Um, <laughs> we've stayed in touch uh, since we met in graduate school. And uh, I went into academia, as you mentioned. So I've been in a couple different academic institutions and now at University of Arizona in the Eller College of Management. And I took more of the research route. So I do a lot of experiments and survey studies and um, qualitative interview studies to try to understand how to create happier, healthier workplaces. And um, as I was working on that research, I recognized a gap between our understanding of the science that's out there on promoting workplace wellness and what companies are doing. And Patricia and I, um, as good friends do. We were at a wedding and we were drinking wine. And, <laughs> always uh, first with wine. Yes. yes, yes. Always. <laughs> it was, it's it all good ideas. So we um, were talking about this and Patricia, I'll let her share a, a little bit about her perspective too, but she was seeing something similar with clients um, after she went into the um, consulting or into the applied realm. And we were talking about, well, why isn't anyone doing anything about this to try to translate the science to workplaces in a way that they could use and employees could apply on the job. And that's how Worker Being was born. Um, and what we've been trying to do since then is to spread the word through a blog and a podcast and also through speaking engagements and organizations to try to understand how we can really get the word out there about how to create happier and healthier workplaces. So Patricia, I'll turn it over to you to add anything I missed and to introduce yourself. Thank you. I don't think you missed a lot. Um, definitely started with wine. It's always a good place to start. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Katina and I met in grad school, as she mentioned, and I went the applied route, if you will. So I decided to go into the business world and consult and use my educational background in that space. So majority of my career has been in consulting, had some internal HR type roles as well. Um, but mostly I've been working with clients and organizations to help them understand their employee experience and how they can improve it. Um, but kind of along the whole spectrum of the employee life cycle from how do you hire the right people to how do you retain them? How do you make sure they're engaged while they're there? And then as they leave, how can you learn why they're leaving and make things better again, right? So just kind of that whole cycle is where I've been involved um, throughout my career in a variety of different roles. And as Katina was mentioning, you know, we have people come to my organizations where I was working, clients coming in and talking about the challenges they've had, but a lot of times they're not thinking about the cultural piece. They're not thinking about wellness kind of more broadly for their employees um, when they're trying to fix retention challenges, um, engagement challenges. They're often thinking about maybe a good fit to the job, performance issues, um, but they're not always thinking about the whole picture of the employee's experience. And there's so much research out there that's really strong and good that Katina was doing and all of her colleagues, and it wasn't getting to the folks that needed it. Um, so again, as Katina was mentioning, that's how Worker Being was born, with providing that content. And now we've been working with clients ourselves to kind of help provide um, you know, more of that insight, helping coach leaders, executive development types of things to help them understand what they can do, what behaviors they can implement to make a difference in the workplace. I already oh, have a million hard. questions that are totally <laughs> not in any of our prepared questions. Can I, 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 I want to jump in with this super quick. I just have a question for you, Patricia. Did you start with a large firm in like mid-level, high-level businesses, like with lots of employees, or did you boots on the ground, small consultant? I was working in a small consulting firm. So the, the firm was about a hundred people um, and majority of our clients were government agencies, actually. So when I started out, I was really focused on government agencies. I was living in DC at the time. Um, and that's where I kind of got my start. And then after that, as I moved throughout my career, I've worked with so many different industries, you know, from tech to retail, restaurants, hospitality, um, healthcare, transportation, just kind of everything you can think of. Uh, realistically, a lot of different types of organizations like to think they're unique. They're yeah, not that unique. <laughs> they oh, tend yeah. to have a lot of the same challenges. Everybody thinks their business. There's none like it, and it, they're. <laughs> and then if you've ever read the E Myth, then they tell you, no, we're all just making pies. We're all a bakery. We're just doing the same thing. But we, we're all unique like everyone else. The the question I'm gonna, and it's funny that you you were like B to G, the governmental thing, because you know government gets a mandate. It's like we're gonna do this, and and okay, they bring you in and you try to integrate it. I'm really curious about 
the corporate leader CEO guy that wants to integrate it, but like try to get buy-in because everyone's like, oh, this is an idea. Yep. Okay. We're having a very, you know, you're feeling very communist today and we're going to have this hippy dippy thing. And then it's, <laughs> it's going to wash off. That's something, you know, oh man. And there's so many questions I have for you. Cause I love the, the integration and like the psychology of it is what really drives me from mar a marketing standpoint. I'm always trying, I, we have a, we have a dear friend, Bart Dunn, we were talking about, and we're always like, how do you get buy-in? And that's the, that's the secret. And maybe you guys know it through behavioral science. The buy-in is definitely the hardest piece, right? It's how do you tell a CFO to care about the employee experience yeah. when really what they care about is the bottom line, right? They need to make sure they're keeping their shareholders happy. If it's a public company, they need to make sure that they're making money or able to continue as a business. Uh, so really you have to tie everything back to the bottom line, right? And there's a lot of research behind this and there's a lot of data that basically tells you that employees, when they're happy, when they're feeling good, they're feeling healthy, their mental health is good, their physical health is good, they're gonna be more engaged, they're gonna be mo more motivated at work, they're gonna be more productive at work. Um, so they're gonna actually impact your bottom line long term. So you find, right? and, and so there's, there's that part. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I wanna add, let's define something you guys use throughout all your, your uh, information, thriving in the workplace. So just real quick before we go on, what's your definition of thriving? Yeah. I think, uh, and I like this question because construct definitions are very important in research. Um, <laughs> but uh, th thriving. Not nebulous ones? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we think of thriving and the way that the research thinks about thriving is an employee's ability to really be able to grow and flourish. So this is looking at their well-being in terms of their job attitudes. Do they like the job that they have? Do they feel connected to people? Do they feel like they're part of a broader purpose? And also that their other indicators of wellness are in line. So are they physically feeling well? Do they experience more positive than negative emotions over the course of the day? Um, how can we help people to feel socially connected to a fabric? So I think thriving is several different things and we would sort of align it with our definition of wellness um, which has evolved over time and emerged in light of some independent research that we've been doing as worker being to try to figure out what people mean when they say wellness but thriving is really a holistic state where you're able to feel like you're growing and flourishing as a person fulfilling the purpose that you're meant to be through these physical social and emotional channels all right, so when we ask about a definition, it's because, you know, you're the one doing the research. Patricia's got to apply it, so she has to know what the definition <laughs> of, of thriving is. So um, with that said, I think we, we were going to ask what's two of the biggest obstacles you think you see to thriving in the workplace. Josh and then Patricia just mentioned uh, buy-in. And so that that's one, I think that's a, an important one. But what what's a second obstacle that you see to employees thrive in the workplace? I would say the biggest obstacle is probably leadership, <laughs> which, um, you know, all the leaders listening out there, it's not to say that there aren't amazing leaders out there, but leaders, um, especially senior executives can have a tendency, as I mentioned, to focus on the bottom line. So that comes down to how they focus and manage the business as well, not just as to whether or not they buy into this type of work and, and activity. Um, so when leaders are not creating the right environments, that's where you tend to see burnout happening. People are expected to work too many hours. Workloads are too high. Um, when people go on vacation, there isn't a practice of actually letting them disconnect. You keep emailing them and texting them and all of that. So all of the, th the behaviors that create a toxic work environment typically starts at a more senior level and then trickles down. Leaders have to show by example what is the right behavior how do we actually allow an employee to disconnect how do we make sure our workloads aren't too high are we talking to people understanding how many hours they're working making sure they log off and not work 17 hours in a day but work you know the appropriate amount of time and go off and live their lives so it really comes down to leaders and a lot of the research that katina and i've been doing independently as she mentioned um, we, we've really been focusing on leaders and understanding what their behaviors are and which behaviors are going to drive a positive thriving work environment and which types of behaviors are going to do the opposite. 
and really kind of destroy the environment and then create toxicity, burnout, and all the things that we don't want to see. I have a million questions again. I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> yeah. Go for it. We love it. Yeah. No, I just... Go ahead, oh, Josh. No, no. I'm just like the the way you get the the corporate leaders, I know so many of them. I was in an organization called EO, Entrepreneurs Organization here in the Valley, and they're like 140 CEOs of companies probably managing a couple of million employees. I mean, it's like every one of them wanted this. They really did. I would go to events and seminars and like they wanted this and they'd come back with it like Right. We'd come back from like a, an, they called them alchemy, an event. And we would learn all these awesome things. I remember doing, uh, oh gosh, they're down in, down in Tucson, uh, Dove Mountain. Um, uh, what's the Ritz Carlton? Ritz Carlton taught us the Ritz Carlton way. And it's just like this awesome way to, for customer service. And like, I was like, oh my gosh, I want this. And I came back and taught it and it lasted three days. And then everyone's like, oh, he's just going to come back with another one of these ideas and it won't stick. And then you get, it's a, you get flustered and, and have a hard time with it. So I just, I wonder like what, cause I know the type, I know the CEO type, it's the ADD we mean to, and then we're off. So I just want <laughs> how you deal with that. It's like the accountability of it. Yeah. I think there are a couple of things that we have found work and that are embedded in some of the research that we've been doing. So the first is that I think leaders can be motivated and have great intentions, but they might not always know what to do. So it sounds like in some instances, people have more of a behavioral framework for how to get things implemented. But a lot of the wellness related content that we see are things that are either trying to convince people that this is a problem they should care about, right? So, um, but if you already have people who are believers, you don't really need to spend time on that content. Then there's other content that's helping them understand what are the problems that are being caused, but there's not a lot around direct solutions to counter those problems that are really detailed and action oriented. And so one thing that I think that happens is there's a lot of motivation, there's a lot of energy, and then you go to apply it and it doesn't transfer into the realities of your everyday job. So it yeah. just gets bogged down in the stuff that you're doing on a day to day basis and it doesn't end up getting applied. So I think that's one thing is this action oriented piece. But I also think there's this other piece, which is that even if you know the actions, but you don't plan how you're gonna integrate them into your actual scheduling or what behaviors are you gonna take away and replace that you personally need to think that through, those behaviors can drop by the wayside. So even if I know, okay, I need to do these five things differently, if I'm not putting on my calendar, so I'll give an example. One uh, thing that we suggest that people do is to have more frequent one-on-ones with employees where they can actually get into a deep dive of what that employee considers wellness for them, things that are going well for them, not as well for them, so that they can tailor solutions to fit the employee, right? You can have every intention to do that, but if you don't go home and put those meetings on your calendar and then also make a sticky note to yourself that says, do not move these meetings when other people book over them as a reminder, you may book them, but then you may move them or you may never book them at all. So I think there's a difference between intention and action. And then there's a difference between action and planful action, which is how am I actually going to integrate these actions into my repertoire? And we try to build that into our um, workshops and things because we just see a lot of energy yeah, and not a lot of outcome. Yeah, I see. And that's why I think when you talked about like how the CFO thinks like this, they're all different types. So you have to address each one of them. And that's what like, because you have the CFO that's this, the CEO that's the dreamer. You have the, the sales <laughs> manager that's just like, I just need sales. You know, it's like, <laughs> just stay away. I'm, I'm great at what I do, you know? And then you have marketing going, oh, we're going to market, you know? So <laughs> you got to market this chaos. So it's, you know, so I just, I respect what you're doing. And I totally just in my own day to day, I can point out, I had set, like, I wanted to meet with every one of our team members on Friday, 15 minutes. And I've already moved some of them because I'm like, Oh, I got a sales opportunity. So I'm just going to move this. Mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. it goes and that's what happened. So you're mm -hmm. going to make me stick to my Friday meetings. Thank you. <laughs> it's also, I think important. There's a, 
Um, two things to note too, like as Katina mentioned, that the whole actionable piece is really important. And that's part of the impetus of worker being, right? There's so many studies out there. There's so much research out there and it can get overwhelming too, right? If you go to a webinar and they're like, these are the things that you can do to reduce burnout in your workplace. And here's 20 things. Yeah. <laughs> Where do you start? So we I think we are super on excited. Yeah. <laughs> In marketing, we do that and we go, because you'll never be able to do these yourselves. You need me. Look, you know, come like, to me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fair, fair you point. You guys should do the same thing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that's but that's exactly right. Like, there's just so much content out there. There's a lot of information, a lot of different things that could work. But how do you know where to start and what's going to work best for you? And then once you've kind of figured out what's that starting point, as Katina mentioned, having that actionable plan that you're really figuring out exactly what you want to do. And I do think that having accountability partners is super helpful as well. So we try to encourage when we do workshops and people to meet up with each other, set that on their calendar as well, uh, so that they continue to have conversations, whether it's somebody within their organization, outside of their organization, but having other people check in on this um, makes you more likely to keep those meetings and not move them because you know, oh gosh, Katina's going to call me and I haven't met with any of my employees and I'm going to feel really bad about that. Um, yeah. So some of that can help as well. Awesome. We go back to the the buy-in where the leaders have to think that this is important. Um, there, there is a, a podcast, uh, internal communication podcast, this guy from uh, UK, and I had met with him and we talked and he asked me, why the, I didn't I had no idea why there was no internal communication podcast in the US. Of course, I start looking and this is only 14, 18 months ago and I couldn't find any. And, you know, so when we were talking about that, because all the content that all of these in the UK and other European countries, they they talk about, a, a, you know, thriving in workplace and a lot of these things and how to get buy in from leadership. You know, Josh was asking, where do you start? Well, where do we start? Because we don't even have leaders that are willing to listen or even know that they should maybe consider be willing to listen when it comes to, you know, a lot of these things. So how do you guys get in the door? If somebody's not already drinking the Kool-Aid, how do you get them to be any, be interested? Yeah, I think usually there are some champions that want this to happen in the workplace um, who can start to at least bring us in to have the conversation, right? But you're going to run into, even in an organization where there are some folks who are keen on this, and maybe those folks are sitting in HR or something like that, right? Um, you're going to run into these roadblocks, like you're saying. And I think that one of the things that seems to be effective as we're having discussions with leaders is asking them about what bugs them about their own work lives. So while they may not care that much about the broader structure of like workplace wellness initiatives or things like that, or think that that's a good investment of time. They have gotten annoyed about having their phone ring while they were on vacation. They get irritated that they can't put their kids to bed uh, because they have to be on a conference call late at night. Um, they get frustrated that they can't go to happy hour on Wednesday with their significant other because they have to be on a conference call late or early. They have to get up earlier than they want to, right? So all these sorts of things that um, bug them about their own work, we can start to get them to realize that those things actually are part and parcel of the culture that they are co-creating. So we actually talked with someone who complained to us about the fact that, you know, they can't take any vacation time without getting interrupted. And then when we asked them if they interrupt other people's vacation time, they said that they did. So it's like, <laughs> you're doing the thing that yeah. you want people to do to you, right? Um, and so if you can start to get people to see that these shifts in the culture are personally beneficial for them in being able to continue to perform how they want to, they know on some level that they could do what they need to do differently, but still get to the same outcome. And so sort of giving it as a, it's still a personal angle that we're coming at. It's not really a collective angle, um, but giving them a reason to care that, you know, this might actually end up making your life happier and less hectic and less stressful. And you might have to put out less fires because other people on your team grow better connections with each other and support each other better. So I think that's one avenue that um, seems to make some headway. So that's I think we awesome. Also... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Patricia. I was just going to say, I think we're also currently benefiting from big like thought leadership types of organizations like Gartner, um, you know, McKinsey, those big consulting firms, they're talking about some of these connections between burnout and productivity, burnout and, re you know, retention issues. So 
when people start to see the data points, that also helps. Um, so getting your foot in the door is always hard, of course, but if you have some data to kind of say, hey, like other people in your industry are experiencing X and this is leading to Y, maybe we should think about how to resolve X, um, then you start to get some more interest and buy in a little bit early on. Like I think with what Katina is saying, it's really important to connect it to the individual person. People do really connect with those stories. They, when they think about, you know, how productive are they on days that they're super, super tired, everyone can relate to that. So that helps get it, personalize it, make it people understand the experience um, from their own perspective. But, but usually that first nudge in the door has to be a data point. Some sort like they're the experiencing burnout. Yeah. In their employee survey, they're seeing that 50% of their employees are burnt out. Ugh, what do they do? What does that mean? Then that's when you start nudging the data and then you can get in the door and kind of help them understand what are the behaviors to change. So we just talked, so we, we got in the door, we educated leadership to some extent. Now to Josh's comment, which is what I call the eye roll test is what happens when the leader <laughs> comes back and says, hey, we're going to do this. Do you remember OKRs, Josh, from somebody? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we had somebody who's like, hey, we're, you know what? Let's implement this. It, it was this OKR you know, thing. And everybody eye rolled because they're like, oh, this is, uh, okay, it's noon. This is the latest thing that he's bringing forth that we're going to do. Um, and I'm reminded of, you guys remember that horrible incident from Better.com, the CEO that fired 900 people uh, through email? Yeah. And so what happened is his communication department, the poor, poor people, they had to then send an email to everybody saying, hey, everything's good. This is terrible, but we're really here for you. And does that pass the eye roll test? So when when you come in and you guys educate a leader and you give them a, a you know, a framework on what to do, what do you do with that next step to take all the employees that have been rolling their eyes for all these other things that have never come to fruition? It takes a lot of time, honestly, and we're very transparent with our um, clients around this because what it, what you have to do is those leaders that maybe didn't care before or weren't exhibiting the positive behaviors have to start showing vulnerability and start explaining where they're coming from. And um, we talk a lot about psychological safety, super, super important if you're making any kind of change like this, if you really want people to be honest with you about what their experience is, their wellness issues, the challenges they're facing to be more productive. They're not going to do that if they don't feel safe in the environment. So with coaching leaders and working with executive teams, we need them to start becoming vulnerable and start practicing things so that the people that report to them start to see it, start to see the change, buy into it, and then can continue to cascade that down. It's not something that happens overnight. It's not something that's like, hey, here's wellness. We're good now, right? Um, you definitely have to start the conversation somewhere and it's going to take time. It's going to be a long transformation to get to an organizational state where everyone feels safe and comfortable and they're able to kind of focus on the things that are important to them in a way that helps them be more productive at work, but also happier in their personal lives. Um, so it's not an easy fix. It's not an expensive fix necessary, necessarily, but it's, an, it's definitely a journey of vulnerability and building safety with team members. Who has time for any of this stuff? That's what I know. I'm <laughs> I'm teach, no, I, and I, I say that as a joke because of our society today. It's like, can I invest in this Bitcoin and be a billionaire tomorrow? What, what am I doing? You know, oh, I just got out of school. <laughs> you mean I don't get, I don't start at $250,000 a year? You know, so you have like, you have all this, like, I want it now. And it's like, that's what I think a lot of owners happens with the CEOs and the management. They go like, but I told you like, you, well, my culture you, uh, change tomorrow, I, bro, I, I told, just told you, you we're changing our culture. What do you mean you feel like this is a toxic work environment? It's not now. <laughs> Poof, my magic wand. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm reminded of a, of a recent really depressing story. Uh, I won't say the name of the organization, but it, it's sort of a competitor to U of A um, that, you know, that I worked at. And so uh, we had uh, a DEI training and it was for directors. And so we're in the room and the person running the department had had introduced it this way i'm so sorry you all have to be here for this but it's mandatory <laughs> and it was it was just yeah. and so you know that yeah. <laughs> you're that's a challenge that you two have to deal with even if you have leaders a little bit more open to it you got a couple people right underneath 
that even though they won't admit it, that, that's their sentiment. And that that's was, what uh, my gym teacher told me a sex ed class. Cause ah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be here. I'm like, I, <laughs> <laughs> Either way or die. That was terrible. I feel like uh, I feel like something that you're you're hinting at is this idea of resistors, right? And um, this isn't from our research. This is from other research that actually came out of the DEI space, which you were just talking about. But um, the idea is that there are a certain percentage of people that are going to be extremely resistant to what you're trying to do. There's going to be another small, small group of people that are going to be extreme champions of what you're trying to do. And there's going to be a bunch of people in the middle that could be swayed kind of either way. Right. And, um, the sort of call to action on that is to not spend so much time early on trying to worry about the people who, you know, just aren't going to get it. They're not going to care. They're not going to get it. Spend more time on the, um, on the champions and getting them activated to help you to spread the word and then use that momentum to try to influence the people who are in the middle to bring them along. And so I think there are, no matter what initiative, I mean, I remember, um, when I was working in, um, an organization in HR very early on in my career and we implemented a new shared drive like folder system and it was like this whole like uproar like people were like but i know where all this stuff is all the people who have been there forever knew where everything was the new people couldn't find anything because it was extremely confusing and so like there was this battle and it didn't stop until they just took away the old shared drive completely like, that was the only way we could get people to stop using it so even something like that there's you know a, a group of people that are like there's literally no way i will save my files to these new folders right um and <laughs> so my daily conversation with my dad but go on yes. <laughs> yes. so there are there's resistance to any kind of change and really when we're talking about wellness we're talking about change management because we are trying to influence the way people structurally think about setting up jobs and think about what is considered a good job and what outcomes we care about and that we care about measuring and keeping track of because we know that they impact either other things we care about or because we care about them just on their own, which the business case is extremely useful. More and more, there are people who care about having the how of how they get to the outcomes as well as the outcome itself. So we're finding more people that do care about that that pull through piece but even for the most curmudgeonly you know people there are um there are eventual avenues but if the best avenue that you can use is everybody else is doing it then try to get everybody else doing it as a way of turning those curmudgeons <laughs> curmudgeon turning yes, yeah exactly <laughs> specialty if you're successful in moving the needle and getting a large percentage of people to focus on this and starting to behave a certain way those leaders that are not doing it, their teams are not going to be as productive. They're going to, their employees are going to be more likely to leave or try to move to a different team. So there's going to be a lot of impact on those folks. And they're either likely going to be kind of pushed out themselves or they're going to leave because it's no longer a fit for them. So in a way, like as difficult as that may be, um, there's likely going to be some loss of leaders that are not buying in just based on the fact that they're not going to be as successful as everybody else. So, so that might change some people's minds, but it might also just mean you're going to have some turnover at that level. And sometimes that's okay. Do you, hey, do you, have you go in it with that, you know, you express that attitude like, Hey, there's going to be uh, what'd you say? Curmudgeons. Yeah, curmudgeons. Yeah. <laughs> I got, you know, I got another name. Do, do you ever, do you ever get it? I'm sure you've been in an organization and you actually have a freaking terrorist. Like, someone, like <laughs> you know, the person that's going to fight every yeah. single thing you do. Yeah. And do you suggest to the own, you know leadership like this person is actually doing you more harm than good? I have definitely done that before. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just express that I don't think this person's helping the situation. There might be ways to, you know, performance manage them a little bit. If not, maybe there's a different solution here. A student who um, came to me with a dilemma. This was several years ago. And he was like, look, you know, we have, uh, he worked in financial services and he was like, you know, I have this, um, group of this team of people and they're absolute rock stars. Like they crush their metrics every month and they're just amazing performers, but, um, they're horrible to deal with. Um, they're, they kick down, they punch up, they fight each other. Um, and, uh, 
as an example of that, he told me that they had been through eight administrative assistance to that group in two years because, um, and that when he was starting to try to piece together through exit interviews, why these folks were leaving, they were saying things like, I eat lunch in my car and cry every day because of how poorly I'm treated by these people. So he was like, is there anything we can do? Like, I mean, there's such rock stars. I, I don't know if there's anything we can do. And two things that we talked through was number one, you're assuming that there are no people who are as good of performers out there who aren't complete jerks. Yeah. So that's one thing. You're <laughs> you're assuming that this level of performance can't ever come with also a person that's not this way. And two, think about your definition of rock star because there's some collateral damage that these folks are doing that you're not quantifying when you're looking at their performance numbers, like how much time and energy you've had to put into backfilling these positions and the cultural elements that they're sort of poisoning throughout the organization. As these folks ascend through the organization, those collateral damages are only going to get bigger. So maybe your definition of rock star might also need to change a little bit uh, to be more comprehensive, not just around the numbers, but around the net impact that they're having on the organization. And that was a really productive conversation. But I think a lot of people get stuck in that, that, um, you know, they, they won't say, well, we will let somebody go who's a good performer because they're having these other impacts. But if they quantify those impacts, it actually offsets some of what they're seeing as a positive return. Yeah. You're trying yeah. to take some of those intangibles and, and mm -hmm. bullet point them so they can, you know, exactly. they can relate to them. So, now this guy's Sid Vicious. That's yeah. You got a rock star. Yeah. Right? But, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And you can uh, quantify so, the cost of turnover and, you know, how much it costs mm -hmm. to train somebody and all those things. And usually those numbers are much, much higher than people think. So, you know, maybe they're bringing in $200,000, but they probably cost the business 300, you know, mm -hmm. and yep. the pain, like it yeah. is a pain, like no one, let, no one enjoys hiring right, no. and firing. So they go, <laughs> right. I'll either, I'll either tolerate awful because I don't want to have to find, or, I, yeah. you know, or they feel their health as an owner. I had felt you know, I even hate the term owner anymore. I think owner of a business it sounds so weird. Anyway, but the, <laughs> the, you feel held hostage by the position because you go, oh my God, I'm going to have to do it again. I, mm -hmm. I built my business to get out of doing that. And now, oh, I might have to do it again. And that yeah. fear lets you keep awful around mm -hmm. sometimes. So it's mm -hmm. like breaking that mindset, you know, is, is so hard to do. I I just know from that position. Yeah. Dean, I'd like to... Uh, yeah. I'd like to pivot a bit if we could. And one of the things that uh, concern um, Josh and I, and we're relating this to thriving in the workplace, is us seeing this growing gap of people who, even in our small organization of companies, um, and then others that we consult with, this growing gap of employees that are getting left behind and now with AI. Um, what, are you, what are your thoughts on how we can help those people thrive because if they're uh, inadequate or if they're insecure and they're falling behind there's two things that they could do they could buckle up and, and figure it out uh, but more often than not they just fall further behind yeah it's a it it can be a very devastating problem for an organization and for obviously the people involved um when they're starting to kind of fall behind some of the new technologies i think um the biggest thing that can help improve that gap is really, really strong change management. So I think organizations really need to invest in really good change management to help people along the journey. Like you're gonna need to learn this because this is where this is going, this is where the team is going, this is how the structure, the tasks are moving, et cetera. Um, but giving them that change management so they can help push them along, kind of as Katina's already mentioned, getting your champions, helping those champions help other people around them so that they can move the needle in the right direction. There's going to be some fall off, just like we talked about those resistors, very similar situation when you're dealing with a technological gap. Some people are just not going to be willing to put in that effort and that work, and you, know, you can only do so much to bring them along with the journey. Uh, but I think there's something around, if you build that psychological safety we've already talked about, and people can be vulnerable and express earlier that they're worried about something. They don't feel like they get it. They're not sure about this. Then you know what the problem is and how to help them fix it. If you don't have that safety involved in the change management, if you don't have an environment where people can speak up and, and raise those concerns, then you're going to see more, more people say, lost. I don't know what the hell is going on. Everybody else does, right? They don't want to mm -hmm. say that. 
So it's exactly. one of the tools in your is one of the tools in your uh, thriving in the workplace toolbox, continuing professional development. Yeah, I was just going to talk about retraining and thinking about one part of that strong change management. Um, I've been in organizations before where if there's going to be um, some sort of a layoff to a particular position, so let's say they can anticipate that a technology is going to replace a position, they can think about the competencies or skills that that position already has and help people to locate other opportunities outside of their organization that could help them to redeploy those skills in a different way, or they can offer some uh, skill training so that they can add on new skills that will help them be prepared for a different job role. Um, and I think there's really a lot to be said about a message that is, you know, we are no longer going to be employing people who do X job because they're going to be replaced by Y technology, have a nice life versus, um, you know, we recognize that this is really challenging and that you've given us a lot of your time and energy. And we'd like to make sure that this transition is as smooth and as compassionate as possible by providing these additional resources. And that goes a long way, not just for the folks who are in those job roles, but also for the people who stay in the organization. Um, I don't know if you've ever been through a, a big layoff and been a person who remained, uh, but the research shows and from personal experience, um, having gone through that one time, once people are laid off, if they're done in a way that's really hasty and it doesn't feel like it's thought through and it feels cruel on some level, um, people will assume that that could happen to them at any moment. And so immediately people start looking for other opportunities. They want to jump ship because they're like, well, who knows? I could be next. And so you lose all these other people who you decided to retain, um, which is also a, a problem. Hovering at the exit the moment that that uncertainty creeps in. You remind me, I'm, I'm a big history uh, guy, like antique collectibles, weird history is my favorite. But uh, um I remember something along the lines and you inspired me to like revisit it. I remember like, I don't know if it was UAW or one of the, uh, one of the big unions when, you know, when everything was getting robotized, you know, they provided the union had the money. You know, if you were in the union, they, they provided like, Hey, you want to go learn how to be a plumber? Cause uh, mm -hmm. you're about to be replaced. And they did that. And, I'm, I'm, um, I'm not an alarmist and I'm definitely not a, you know, I'm not, but it's coming like a freight. He's freight. an alarmist. Um, okay. For clarity. <laughs> when I say no, but it's like, because we're following all these new technologies and testing everything, I sit here going up, oh, I could wipe out that department there. Oh, mm -hmm. I could walk in. I could walk. I, I feel like I, I made a joke on one of Musk's posts the other day. He said, he's looking for, what did he say? He was looking for the, uh, the CE, the CEO of, uh, of of witchcraft or something, and I, and I was like, uh, I'm over. Thanks to AI, I'm overqualified for any job you have. Yeah, and I, I said it as a joke, and then I'm like, no, really, I, I really could sit with with AI to answer any question. It, it's it's it once you learn like the prompting and all these things. As an employee, if I worked for someone, I would be I would be the guy no one would want to hang out with because I'd be going, oh, let me show how it'll make your job easier. People get mad about it. I've mm -hmm. gone to businesses that I'm friends with and said, hey, can I show you something so you guys can catalog quicker? I'll show you this thing I learned this weekend in my garage. I want to show you this. And they were like, no, we know that already. I'm like, well, obviously you don't because your catalog <laughs> is terrible. Like, but but they didn't want they didn't want it. And I'm like, your competitor is going to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, what are you going to do about because it? Because you're practicing it with, you are doing it in your garage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> tinkering with in there. Yeah, yeah. So m what I want to know from you guys, and again, I don't know how to combine the two. I could ask ChatGPT to make this question much more articulate. <laughs> but what I would like is like with the new remote workforce, if I was working remotely now, my robot would be doing it for you. My AI would be doing it for you. Are you seeing any of that? Are people like on their own using AI and then bringing it to the workplace? It, and because a lot of people, I, I know the fight to not come back and be remote. I'm hearing that everywhere. Like, we're just going to tell them they have to come back. Yeah. And they're like, no, I'm not. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the employer is also going, well, good, because I'm not going to need you soon. And you're like, it's this, it's like this bad family dynamic. So Mm -hmm. I talked a lot. Your thoughts. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I do think we are facing a bad family dynamic for sure. um, With that battle that you've described. I think when it comes to using AI in the workplace, personally, I'm of the persuasion that that you use other tools to help things right like we use visualization tools to like help make graphs look better right all of those types of things so why wouldn't you use ai um but there's i think organizations have to think through like the privacy pieces all that fun stuff what can you put in there what can't you put in there what kind of tools so there's i think there's some fuzziness about some of that today but i don't think it's necessarily a problem if you've learned how to make your job more efficient um, then go for it. And in my opinion, that's a good thing because then you either have more time for your job or your job gets into the eight hours it's supposed to be in and not the 15 hours it used to exactly. be. Exactly. Right? So you or should three definitely. Hours. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, whatever. I love works. your take on I love your that's, take on it. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking <laughs> the measurement of, of your. Uh, and my fear, of course, is going to be like, well, because of AI, you can get 900 hours in the yeah. four hours. <laughs> And that's going to be the owner mindset. And then the Mm -hmm. other is going to be like, no, but I got my eight hours done. So that it's Mm going to be, how are those going to be determined, the output? And by the way, we're going to have to know the name of your dog for tagging in a photo so we can get it. (laughs) He's just all over the place right now. What's his name? Finn. He's He's a good Irish dog. Finn. (laughs) I'm thinking Finn, uh, my nerdiness here, I'm thinking Finn from Star Wars. Oh, oh, that's, that's oh. really nerdy. Um, I, it's actually, I love the name Phineas, so it's short for Phineas. Oh. <laughs> Do you remember Phineas Boggs? Does anybody remember that? Bad no. 70s, oh, I'm, I'm older. Phineas no. Boggs. Phineas Boggs, he was a, a it was a time traveler, like yeah. sci-fi show from the 70s, early oh. 80s. And the guy was like really, everybody loved the guy. He was one of those actors that died too young, Phineas Boggs. Oh. Yeah, no, I think I the only reason him. I've heard it is because someone... In my grade school, one of the teachers used to call one of the students Phineas Boggs, but I don't think we ever knew what it was. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Josh, he's highlighting the age difference. So what you're talking about, I was in grade school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, if we talk about like 70s pop culture, 70s, 80s pop culture, I'm just all day. Just, it comes with no hand. It's not handy at all. Don't, well, please don't get I'll say the name is a little, a little nerdier than that. I read a book, a separate piece back in high school I loved it and the character's name is Phineas and therefore my dog is named Phineas so that's a great <laughs> reason to be named Phineas now I'm embarrassed because I'm thinking Phineas and Ferb from yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that I do know <laughs> I know that one yeah. all right good yeah oh. all right um so I want to uh, ask something else so we talked about things that you're currently doing and some of the obstacles what do you see in 2024 are there any new obstacles on the horizon for thriving in the workplace Personally, I think where we are today, like the obstacles that we're facing with uh, kind of this conflict between owners and leaders of companies and employees is likely to continue in the next year or so where, um, you know, we're going to see, I think we're already seeing a lot of companies doing the return to work, as you mentioned, um, come into the office and people don't want to do that. So I think we're going to see more like we're going to see engagement drops. I think we're going to see people shifting around when they can. But I think because of all the layoffs that have happened, so like economically the stuff going on, people are less likely to leave, but they're going to hold on and they're going to tank things inside because they are just not as engaged because they're upset about what happened and that their perspective and what they needed was not taken into consideration. So I think that we're moving to a place where that, that conflict is going to continue until um, we start to see some shifts and changes in how people are approaching working with their employees and getting their employees to, you know, understand why, if you want them to come to the office, why, what is the purpose? What is the data behind that purpose? Can you help them really know the change? And sometimes it makes sense to have people come into the office. Of course, there's some roles that you can't do at your house. Like you cannot be in manufacturing in your home. Uh, You cannot be making burgers in your house. (laughs) Well, maybe you can, but not for the public. So there, there was um, several incidents um, that were well publicized where companies put out a survey, like, do you want to return, you know, to the office? And uh, they didn't. 
you know, by a high percentage, eight, I can't remember, you know, but there was an 80s, 90%, they didn't want to return. And so the worst thing was the leadership said, well, you are going to return. Like, mm -hmm, even though mm -hmm. we went and we did this, we gave this survey, we really don't value your opinion because we yeah. already made our, our mind up. So yeah, you um, skipped that part, Dean. That was actually a survey that was sent out asking them if they wanted to come back, mm -hmm. and the survey came yeah, that, back. That's, no. I'm sorry. Yes. Oh yeah, that's yeah. What I'm and, no. there was, and then they're like, was, "Well, we don't care." And they published yeah. what the results were, and then said, "You still have to come back." That was dumb. Back. You should yeah. have altered this data. I don't know what were you were thinking. <laughs> right? No, we don't want people to alter data. No, we're yeah, no. the little <laughs> But the there's data. There's a. I think. I think part of, or a common thread through what we're saying is that there will, and there, this is sort of tale as old as time in some ways, this has always happened generationally, right? There's a stubbornness or a stickiness around, this is the way I came up and so everybody has to come up this way. And there's an over attribution towards the things that people have gone through to why they're successful. So, you know, people, people who have been successful look back and they say, well, all of the things that I went through must be contributing to my success. Um, all the hard things, all the easy things, etc. right? All of these things made me who I am. And the reality is that there are lots of different pathways towards being successful and there are different ways of measuring success. And so I think ultimately what ends up happening is people erroneously assign positive impact to things that have happened to them in the past. And they didn't have another option or another comparator group. So especially with this return to work, people are like, well, you know, the reason that I was successful is because I was in the office every day yeah, sure. and mm -hmm. I can learn from people and I can talk to people. Well, that's probably true that doing those things was partially what contributed to your success, but there wasn't another option for a way for you to do that. So the real question is, how does an alternative option compare to what you've experienced? And they don't have a really great answer to that question to back up their rationale, right? So I think there's this like, in my day, we did it this way. And that's the reason why things have turned out well, and things aren't going to go well, if they go a different way. And that's just yet. not the case. So and I'm reminded, Josh, I think I've told you this before, I can't remember. So for a number of years, I ran marketing and promotions for a couple of casinos. And so if somebody won on the slot machine, if they won, uh, you know, big jackpot, and right before they won, they coughed and took a sip of a drink and then they won. What they do is they cough and take a sip of the drink and mm -hmm. then pull it. And then they call and they, they do it and they associate this completely unrelated thing, mm -hmm. no ounce of logic to it, uh, into their success of what they did. And so, yes, I, I, I see that on, on both ends. Yeah, totally. I think that there's, yeah, there's that kind of superstition, that kind of looking back on your own experience, these rosy glasses. Um, and then I think what's happening with people asking the question, like the surveys you talked about, definitely seen a lot of those. And I think that intent there was really positive, right? Because they probably, a lot of people felt like, well, I think some people want to come back to the office. I think more people want to come back than we are, you know, giving them credit for what have you. Then when it comes back the opposite way, they're everyone kind of buckles down like, no, 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 no. But it was supposed to be that everyone wants to come back and that's what we're going to do. Um, and what they've done instead is actually create a bigger gap between the leadership teams and the employees, because now the safety is gone. The trust is gone. The fact that somebody wanted your opinion and then didn't take it and didn't care about it, that's going to create a really negative environment. So we talked about psychological safety and growing that and how long it can take. A lot of people have made a mistake of just kind of severing that. And so then now you're going to have to rebuild that if you want people to come in and fully engage and, and really want to contribute to the thriving of the company, um, they need to feel like they're valued and that they're, um, you know, what they do is important and they're not going to feel that right now because of the, the fact that, that that disconnect occurred. So I think there was a, a gap in terms of understanding of how big of an impact the perception change can be and how, mm -hmm. how hurtful it can be to the, the employee's perspective and the perception of the company. Yeah, I'm going to take to heart the, the way you concisely say psychological safety, because I, I think that's important. Josh and I talk all the time about certain employees and I'm going to have to look at it through the lens. Well, I think I am, but am I giving them that safety to be able to you know say and, and do what, you know, what's on their mind? Um, so uh, at, before we wrap up, I wanted to uh, ask both of you, um, you're, you know, you guys are in your, your, uh, bubble right you know what you know and you have 
Ian and Josh right now, we're very receptive to learning about this. What is what is something you would like people outside your sphere of influence that, to know? What was something that you, you know, like psychological safety, what is something that you would just like everybody to know right off the bat? Yeah, I think something that's really core to our messaging, and it's a, it's a great question um, because we're all about translation, right? So we want uh, the science to get out to as broad of an audience as possible. I think a lot of times what seems like a person problem is a context problem. And part of what we're really starting to push on with companies is we can come in and we can do all the individual level, hey, learn how to be more mindful, learn how to balance your schedule better, learn time management skills, all this stuff. We can do that at the individual level all day long. But if the structural way that the work is is being assigned, the amount of work that's being assigned, the culture of the organization is constantly battling those things, you're creating a problem that then you're trying to solve, right? So I think a takeaway would be if you're looking for ways to support wellness at work, instead of addressing things at this very individual level and saying, oh, okay, you're you're feeling overwhelmed, well, learn, you should learn how to manage your time better, right? Like it's about your personal skill. Um, really looking at the structural ways in which the organization is reinforcing these cultures that then produce these bad behaviors, high levels of stress, and then lower levels of performance if you don't look at the structural level, you're constantly going to be fighting yourself and you're going to be investing money into solving a problem that you're creating. That's awesome. So um, oh. I would like somehow to take that and to have the people in Josh and I, our lives to, to get that, <laughs> get that yeah. message uh, across. So before we um, wrap up, I was hoping uh, the two you could share maybe uh, how people can get in touch with you or learn more or use your services. Sure. Yeah. So you can find a lot about us on our website, workerbeing.com, which is, um, we spelled it a little funky. So it's W O R K R B E E I N G. Hence the buzz. The being is a B. Um, <laughs> so you can find a lot about us and our services on our website. You can email us at contact at workerbeing.com. Um, so that's a great way to get in touch. If you have any questions or you need anything, also would love to connect with you on LinkedIn. Uh, you can just look for both of us. Pretty easy to find uh, Patricia Grabark, Katina Sawyer, and you can find us there. Um, and then I would say, finally, you know, we also have a podcast called Thriving at Work. Um, and we put out new articles every week as well on our website. So if you follow along um, on LinkedIn or, you know, either find our website or our podcast, you'll be able to get updates on everything that we're doing and all the research that we're talking about. Wow. Thank you. Well, I'm, a, hey. I'm, I'm a subscriber. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> I, am too, I am too. Like I said, I listened to a couple podcasts the, today and everybody go over there and check it out. It was awesome. Thank you guys for a great discussion. A huge thank you to both of you. I, I just really love you guys sharing your wisdom and insights with us today. You know, the intersection of AI, technology gap, workplace culture, it's what we always try to talk about. So uh, we, you know, we didn't jump into a lot of AI today because oh, I want to get back with you guys and talk. Yeah. About it. I really want to because I, I think it's going to get really interesting and I would love to have you guys back. You, you guys Anytime. were awesome. So please, yeah, please, everybody. Also, for our Wise Bites TV fan, please share this. Post your likes, comments. We'll have it up on YouTube. We're going to have a blog blog of this. We're going to have a podcast of this. We're going to have all sorts of stuff. And and we're definitely going to feature feature uh, Finn. Finn is definitely going to be in one of our shorts. <laughs> you, know, you guys are fantastic. Right. Thank you so very much. And uh, that's it. That's what we got. So, right. Thank you for having us. Thank it was you. fun. Thank you.